Why the heck is Disney making me charge adult prices for my 10 year old? Hey y'all, it's LJ here, owner and founder of Smart Moms Plan Disney and Smart Moms Travel. We are so glad you're here for another episode of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast. Now, here's your host, Allie. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast. I'm Allie, joined today by Becky, who I am so excited to have the conversation we're going to have together today. I consider her somewhat of an expert in this area, and this episode is going to be so much fun. Before we dive in, of course, I want to thank all of our listeners, people that are listening to this the day it has been released, or if you have already subscribed wherever you're listening, we are so grateful for you and your support. That is the quickest way that if you like our content or you want more episodes from us, that's the best way to support this. And we are really grateful. So if you haven't already, please make sure you are liked and subscribed wherever you're listening right now so that whether you listen in the car or while you're taking care of your kiddos, this episode hits your platform immediately. Also want to give a quick reminder and shout out to all of our Patreon subscribers. If you have not already checked out our Patreon, we have two tiers and our Diamond Mind level is in on conversations with us every single day of the week. We're talking, diving deeper into the topics of the episodes. It's been so much fun already. And as that community grows, we are just really having a great time over there in the Patreon. So check it out. Link is in the bio and it comes with a great value. Our listeners and Patreon subscribers are getting some really important, helpful guides, the stuff that you really, really need to make those trips with your kiddos the most magical they can possibly be. So check those out. Check out Patreon, like, and subscribe. Again, we are just so grateful. Of course, stay tuned to the end of the episode where we are going to have another guest spot special interview with another Smart Moms travel agent where we are going to break down ways that the Disney dining plan can be useful to a really select group of our listeners. Back to today. Hey, Becky, what's up? Oh my gosh. I am so just in this momming mode. You know, when you have to fake it till you make it because the kids still have places they have to get to and you have the cold that's never going to let go. That's where I'm at today, but so excited to talk about this topic today. Yeah, we're both in that, you know, post-holiday break mode. (laughs) You know, it's early January right now and it's it's easy to get stuck and one of the things that honestly helps me is is doing this is talking about disney thinking about disney planning disney and i think we're all kind of in that phase where we're thinking about the year ahead and some of what we can do to make this year ahead the best it it can possibly be and for most of us that's going to mean travel and for a lot of us that's going to mean travel to a disney destination As we are recording this, it is day two of some really big changes at Walt Disney World for 2024 and very likely beyond. I'm talking changes that have been different since before the the shutdown three years ago, over three years ago at this point. My goodness. Some things that people traveling to Disney right now and beyond, they can expect that have changed. We have no more park reservations. That's huge. Like, do you even remember what it feels like to go to Disney World? And this is, of course, with a date-based ticket. So anybody that has a package or is buying dated tickets, no more park reservations. Can you remember what it was like to go to Disney World and not have to make a park reservation? Honestly, it felt so carefree, but I don't really remember it because I honestly didn't think it was ever going to go away. When Disney got control of how many people are coming into each park, I'm like, what's the chances that they're ever going to give up that control? But I am so excited because we're back to the point of being able to decide, oh, I didn't get the individual lightning lane I wanted. So I'm going to swap and do a different park today and try again on another day. Like the freedom that comes if you have a date based ticket, right? That is so freeing when it comes to the planning piece. I am looking on to my first trip of 24. You know, we're a week and a half into the year. I haven't been to Disney World yet. My first trip, it's going to be the weirdest feeling to wake up. And of course, you still have to do a lot of strategizing because if you want to eat at those restaurants, you have to have ADRs. 60 days in advance with your travel agent. So of course, you're still going to be planning and you're still going to have an outline of where you want to go and what you want to do. But the freedom and flexibility to change, it's going to be the weirdest feeling. I can't, I'm ex- I'm so excited. You know, I, I kind of remember it more so from trips when I was a little girl with my family, just kind of waking up and being like, where do we want to head? Or it, it, it's, it's exciting and it's really different. And sort of along those lines, another change we're seeing that's enhancing your trip and doing nothing but good for you is park hopping. I think that the opening up of park hopping before 2 p.m. now 
really adds value to your park hopper ticket but because you can go and rope drop a, a park that you want to go to. Let's say you really want to get in Slinky Dog and Tower of Terror, but then you're going to spend the rest of your day in Epcot, hop on the Skyliner, and you don't have to wait till 2 p.m. anymore. It's so exciting. It's mind blowing to think that you could visit two parks by 10 a.m. <laughs> you know, you really can. You could do that again. And for rides and shows and strategies, I mean, this is an entirely, it's opening up a world of opportunity, honestly, for what you can see and do. I feel like when we did the four park challenge together last year, right? How strategic we had to be because of that. We were mentally and physically exhausted because of that four park challenge because you had no freedom in where you were going until 2 p.m. That took out essentially half of your day to be able to move. Yeah, we had 2 p.m. to park close to hit three parks. It was overwhelming. And it's funny that you mentioned that because we did do that together. I actually uh, didn't make it to the fourth park, so I've never personally completed the four part challenge because I got sick in park three. But I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because what it actually has done to me is started my wheels spinning on the six park challenge where mm. you, start, you do all the parks in Florida and then you fly a same day flight to California and do the parks out there. I Like that is on my bucket list. I'm definitely doing it. I'm probably not doing it until my kids are older, but I'm definitely doing it. And that was one of the first things I thought of is it's like these challenges because I'm so competitive are now open back up for me to do and actually do well. That's a coast to coast challenge. That would be so exhilarating to do that. When you first said six park challenge, I thought you were saying both water parks. Oh my gosh, could you throw two water parks on top of four parks in a day? Talk about ways to ruin a vacation <laughs> a vacation day. Yeah, yeah but I, I mean, I am going to do that. I just love the freedom and flexibility we're getting now with these changes. And of course, the third big change, this one is huge uh, and it's what we're going to be talking about today is the Disney dining plans. They're back. We've covered them just a little bit on our character meal ranking episode. So if you haven't checked that episode, go back and listen because we gave some quick tips in that because we knew the dining plan was coming. But now it's here. It's active. People are using it. And this is something that adds a ton of value to your vacation. It's going to give you a more all-inclusive feel, even though it's never truly going to be all-inclusive. It truly does take some of the burden and stress away as you're able to pre-plan and pre-budget. And in addition to that, it's just... It's confusing for a lot of people that have never used it. And I'm excited to sort of break it down and talk about ways to hack the system and to use the system to your best benefit. I think when you say it's confusing, it's very much confusing like Genie Plus was when it very first came out. I don't think that it's any more confusing than Genie Plus is. Once you understand the basics of it, it's really simple and it simplifies your day to day. Do you have to have a little bit of planning and forethought into what you're doing? Yeah, but that's the fun of planning a Disney vacation is the planning out what you're going to do, right? Not avoiding looking at what kinds of things you're dreaming about eating and what snacks you want to do and all of those things. I think it adds an extra level of that gamification of your planning, like thinking through how you're going to hack this to do by Disney, because, you know, Disney is going to take every dollar they can from us. How can yeah. we game the system, hack it, get the best bang for our buck and keep our life as simple as possible? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I love that you said gamification, because it's not like with the addition of dining plans. Now, all of a sudden, your Disney trip requires strategy and planning. <laughs> Like nobody was all was going into their Disney vacation really thinking that they were just going to have a leisure time with no thought. So we're just kind of adding another element, yes, to your pre-planning. But it's also one of those things that once you get there, when you've put in the planning and work ahead of time, and especially with the help of your travel agent, you, you are going to have a, a smoother time, more enjoyable time. I know for me, not to get a surprise bill at a restaurant, which is like what I kind of talked about the last time we talked about it on the show, that right there is enough for me to say this is worth it because there's nothing like a really massive dinner bill after a really fun experience to catch you off guard and kind of put a damper on your mood. I completely agree. I think that that just having to be like, turn your head and hand over your credit card is can be very painful when you're paying for a family worth of theme park food. But knowing that you just get to tap your magic band, hand them your key to the world card, whatever method you're going with, it's going to just feel simpler and not pull you back to the real world quite as soon. Yeah. Let's break down a little bit about these plans. So the one thing that I talk to families about all of the time and really try to drive this point home because what happens is you add the dining plan to your Disney package. So when you're building or your travel agent is building your resort and tickets package, this is a feature that you can add on. And what happens is you see your package total go up 
by however much it's going to go up for your specific trip. And that can feel really daunting. But the thing I always try to say is this is not extra money that you weren't going to spend otherwise. This is money you're going to spend either way. So yes, while it can feel a little shocking to see a total get added on to this package that you were building, it's also not like it's money that we pulled out of thin air that you weren't going to be spending on your Disney vacation. You are going to pay to eat. You're going to eat. You're going to pay to eat regardless if you have a dining plan or not. And so taking that total, factoring it into your budget ahead of time and really rolling it into that $200 deposit so you can pay it off slowly over time is a number one, the best strategy. So don't you can't really look at it as this scary. Oh, my gosh. Now my package just went up by X amount. It's sort of like, oh, wow, here's a a total I'm paying either way. And now it's a bit easier. I think a lot of people come back from vacation with sticker shock of their credit card bill on how much they spent on dining. So to have that handled in your emotions, in your mind before you're going on vacation is really peace of mind to just be present while you're there, not thinking about you just continuing to rack up all this money and who knows how much you've spent. It's taken care of for the most part, 100% if you're doing the dining plan. Of course, there's going to be little things along the way, but You basically have paid off your entire trip. Really, like you were saying, all-inclusive, that feeling of all-inclusive, it's never going to be fully all-inclusive. It's not unlimited, but that feeling of what is this bill going to look like at the end is just gone. Uh, That's the number one emotion. Like You just hit me hard because I'm the person that I'm so in the moment. I try to be yes mom when I'm on vacation with my family. I am also the person that when that email comes, from Disney and it has all your charges. I like watch it with one eye. I'm afraid to click (laughs) it. It's so unfun. And it, it really messes with me at the end of a fun vacation. I'm like, well, great. Look at how much I, I spent that I wasn't even aware of. And yeah, of course that's on me, but to know that it's an option now that that feeling is gone, I cannot even express how delighted I will be to click on that and see a lower total. So I I love that you kind of explained it that way because I think it's relatable and it's, it's, frankly, just true. Mm -hmm. You're going to eat. You might as well. You might as well just know what it's going to be up front. Yeah, exactly. So there's two plans now that you can play with. And we should also mention that Disney currently, as we're recording this episode, is even running some promotions right now that are leveling up the value of the dining plan. And for instance, currently, as this is being recorded, there's a Disney Plus promo running. And not only can you get the dining plan, but you can get it for free. So Disney is looking at the dining plan as not only a value to you, but a way to like find greater value in promotion. So you're you're really they're using it as a tool to help to save. and, And it's really exciting. So There are two different types of dining plans you can add. There's the quick service dining plan. And then there's what Disney calls the Disney dining plan. And I kind of loosely uh, casually talk about the Disney dining plan as the full service. But that's kind of what it is. So we'll start here talking about the quick service plan, which is the lesser expensive of the two and kind of what that includes. Becky, talk to me like I'm your client. I've never gone to Disney. I've never used the dining plan before. And quick service dining plan is on the table here. So I would start with talking about what kind of dining you anticipate your family using. Are you envisioning yourself grabbing meals between rides? Are you envisioning taking a break in the middle of your day or at the breakfast or dinner time to really sit down, decompress and spend time talking with your family and having that? If you're the the ride to ride to ride to ride family, that quick service plan is going to be a great fit for you. It's going to give you snacks. It's going to give you um, meals that you can grab and eat really quick and then hit the next ride. It's also going to give you the unlimited refill mug, which is focused on your resort. So uh, that might be a little bit of a different conversation about the resort mug, whether that's a pro or a con. (laughs) But if you are a soda drinker, I think that that's a win no matter what. Because three sodas in and you've already more than paid for the cost of the mug, right? For sure. You get that resort refillable mug for every member of your party that's three and up. So, I mean, you can pour a lot of coffee in that mug, tea or soda, which I honestly think like we don't buy the resort refillable mug when we go on the trips. My I, my mom and my grandpa, who we used to go on the trips together all the time, I just have visions of the two of them with their resort refillable mug. And my grandpa was the guy that but he was going to get his money's worth. He's going to fill that mug and he's going to use it to the death. And I just know that the thought of getting one of those included for him specifically would have been like, we're getting the dining plan. <laughs> I think that a lot of people feel that. And it was if you're a heavy coffee drinker and you're not wanting to have to just use little tiny pods in your room over and over and over, 
The mug works really, really well. People are being so creative with how to make it be able to go with them so that they can grab one before they hop on the bus and then refill it when they're coming back to their room using lanyards, using carabiners to hook them on their strollers. So many creative ways. People are so creative. But know that that mug is tied to resorts. That's not only your resort, though. You could use it if you were going to go and spend some time at Riviera, for instance, in the middle of your day because you wanted to do Topolino's. You could go down and refill your mug at a different resort as well. Yeah, that's a great point. So it's a resort refillable mug, but not just specifically your resort. So look at your plans. And honestly, it's so silly that we're talking about it so in depth. But think about it. People drink a lot of soda. I personally drink a lot of coffee and that right there adds up. Those are expensive things at Disney World. And just knowing that you can get the value all day long, you know, that is unlimited. You've got your soda covered. Yeah. Of course, not not in the parks. Once you have your mug, they activate it from the moment you check in until midnight of the night you check out. You can refill the mug for free unlimited the entire time. It's amazing. It really is such a good value. Uh, so if you know, you know, you get that either way with either dining plan. And then I love that you kind of were talking through the type of family you are because there are a couple of types of Disney families, right? And it really doesn't start by just breaking down each dining plan. It really starts by deciding which dining plan is right for you. If you're the family, like you mentioned, that's running from each ride, or maybe you just want one sit down meal and it's going to be one character meal chances are the quick service plan is going to be right for you. So you get your mug, but then you also get two quick service meals. It's important to point out that the dining plan, either one, everything that's included when it comes to the meals and snacks, not the mug, are given to you in credits that are allotted per night. So if you have a four night stay, then you get four times the credits for each of the dining plan you pick. So if you get the quick service plan, you get two quick service meals per person and one snack per person in credits allotted per night. So that's going to be four snacks and eight meals per person, three and up. I think it's important for um, something else that you just said. One per night. It's not per day of your of your package. So if you're coming in on a Monday and you're getting there late at night and you're flying out on a Friday, you need to take into account how many nights are you staying in the Disney Resort for your package? And that's how many credits will be associated to the, di- the different tiers of the dining plan. Yeah. And that's when it really makes sense to start strategizing when and how you'll use them because you're going to have a meal on the bookend of your vacation, maybe that isn't covered somehow. So you want to keep that in mind. But Knowing that you get those two quick service meals, it makes, you know, we're not necessarily always three meal people at Disney World. We could do the quick service meal at our resort mobile order before we travel to the park. And then maybe not another meal until we do a quick service at the end of the day. And then with a snack in the middle, your day is really covered. So you want to think about, is that enough food for you? How much additional will you be spending if it isn't enough food for you? And the one really great thing is that these credits are very, very easy to monitor. Your Disney app from within the resorts tab of your My Disney Experience app is going to have a little a little button where you can click and track your dining plan credits. So you can see how many per person or per child and adult that you have remaining in your account. And it also shows right at the bottom of your receipt. Anytime you use a credit, it will print out exactly how many credits are there as well. So multiple places for you to monitor what's happening. Using the the credits you're talking about is so easy, whether it be your magic band, your magic mobile, or your key to the world card. So easy to really feel like you can leave the bulk of everything that you carry to pay for things at home, like it's in your room. You don't have to carry a bunch of things because it's so simple. Yeah. And the quick service dining plan is going to be $57.01 per night per adult and $23.83 per night per child. So when you really think about it and you do the math, because I know listeners probably aren't adding up what, you know, all their meals for the day at Cosmic Rays are going to cost. It it roughly can come to about a 20% discount off of like at least your kiddos dining. You know, you really you really do see an overall savings when you stick to the credits and you stick to the things that are included. I think that's also uh, what you're talking about with the child piece. This goes back to some of our very first conversations we ever had about why the heck is Disney making me charge adult prices for my 10 year old, right? Disney dining plan does matter for that. If you have kids nine and under, Disney dining plan is a no brainer. If you have a 10 or 11 year old who's not eating a lot, that might be part of the conversation you need to decide with your travel agent on how and why to strategize the way that you are going to. 
because once they hit 10, they're adult prices. Mm -hmm. And it, it does come down to the strategy of the credits and the value of the overall meal, right? Because mm -hmm. you're looking at even just two character meals that may each cost one credit. And I'm jumping a little ahead here because we're talking about quick service, but you can look at the cost of a meal at one location versus the cost of a meal at another location. And maybe they both still use one credit. And so you really can try to strategize and get the best value for your credits. This piece of the conversation takes me flashbacks because I have used the dining plan multiple times. And it's actually what I think made me fall in love with Disney dining in the first place was because our very first trip to Disney World, we got the Disney dining plan. And it was the days of, you're never going to see that dining plan again. It was when tips were included. It was, you got an appetizer and an entree and a dessert and a drink. You got everything. It was like Disney's giving us money. And when we're doing this, Sean and I were always trying to like take the most advantage of everything we could get. And so we would go to places that we would never have thought we were going to go to. And we ended up falling in love with those places. You hear the same five things, right? You hear the same five restaurants that people talk about. And there is so much beyond those top five, top 10 restaurants. There's hundreds of restaurants on Disney property. And I think that doing the dining plan opened our eyes to trying something that was a little less obvious. I love that. I love that you can use it in your favor to try something new. I also mm -hmm. love, and this is a big one for me because chances are you're traveling to Disney during some sort of festival at Epcot. <laughs> there are very few times of the year where there's not one going on. The quick service can be used or the snack credits can be used at the festival booths at Epcot, at select festival booths at Epcot. So talk a little bit about that component and how you can use that to your advantage. Because those, I mean, we're hitting up and racking up all the time. We really, really are. And I actually think that this is a really great time to talk about the value of the plan and knowing that a snack credit on average is 6 to $7 is what Disney's accounting for. And so if you are going to be a snacker around the world, know that those credits, you, you're given one per night, but you don't have to use them one per day you could use a five all five snack credits to snack around epcot in one day and essentially save your budget there when you're going to use your snack credits though i really want to put the emphasis on right if we want to talk about hacking the system disney's accounting for six to seven dollars as the max they know that people are going to use it for the 350 box of juice they're going to save money that way, but we're going to be better than that. And we're going to hack this system and use it for the $8.50 funnel cake. Or we're going to use it for one of those dome cakes that are almost $9. Like we're going to use them in strategic ways and save those three, $4 things. Tap it on your, or tap it on your magic band and pay cash for that because it's not going to be the best use of that dining snack credit. I love that you just said you don't have to use them across each day. Eat around the world, hack that system and use your snacks, you know, noodles in Japan and uh, street corn in Mexico, you know, those things cost a lot of money. And if you can use your snack credits toward that, and you're getting snack credits with either dining plan. So I encourage anybody that's going to Epcot and using a dining plan, either one, to really, really have that on your radar because that's a huge savings in the long run. Are you a dedicated fan of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast and feel the need to take notes while listening to each and every episode? Our Diamond Mind Patreon subscription is a perfect fit for you. Every month, our Diamond Mind subscribers receive a new Disney travel guide that simplifies and organizes the podcast content. Join our community at patreon.com and search for Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast. Joining our Patreon supports our woman-owned small businesses and allows you more simplicity and support in planning your next Disney vacation. Join us at patreon.com and we'll see you there. What about alcohol? Because a lot of our listeners like to have a cocktail or a glass of wine or in Epcot, you know, a glass of beer. What, what do you do? That's a great question. Uh, and I think it's actually one of the sticker shock things that people are overlooking when they're looking at the, the new costs for the dining plan. Alcohol is built in to both dining packages for people who are 21 and older. So if you're using the quick service and you decide you're in Epcot, you're going to go eat at the barbecue place in the, what's it called? Royal Regal? Oh, Regal Eagle. Regal Yes, the Regal Eagle. The Regal Eagle in the United States Pavilion. You could get a 
massive plate of of meat and sides for your quick service dining. Normally going to cost you like 25 bucks for that one plate and it's a quick service credit. And you can add a beer to your menu if you're 21 or older. I think that's another um, thing to keep in mind is if you're 21 and older, you get the alcohol, but they're not leaving out the kids either because even if you're not 21 and older or if you're not a drinker, we have friends who are adults that don't choose to drink, right? And that's completely okay. You don't have to get a soda with your meal. Your, your beverage credit can be used for a shake, for a smoothie, for some of those upgraded drink options. And it doesn't have to be the alcohol one. It can still be an escalated drink experience. Yeah, absolutely. That is a huge one for me. There's a quick service restaurant over in Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios that has one of my favorite cocktails in all of Disney World. And to be able to include that in my meal I, and just kind of like walk away so proudly knowing I've just beat the system because <laughs> the value is greater than what I paid for the dining plan. I, you know, those are the types of things that I want listeners, people traveling to Disney and trying to get the best bang for their buck to really keep in mind. Don't just throw it away. Like you said, don't just upgrade to the juice box and call it a snack. You know, that is not good enough. Do not use your snack credit on popcorn, for instance. Popcorn, if you're not using the Disney dining plan, popcorn's an amazing snack for your family. Buy the the popcorn container. There's so many collectible ones. We're heading into the art festival, right? What is it going to be this year? It's not going to be figment. We know it's not going to be that. It is figment. It is. <laughs> is it figment it again? Does. So, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you said this. First of all, it, popcorn actually, even if you are using the dining plan, is still a really good snack. And I'll tell you why, because you're not going to be limited to only using your snack credits while you're there. Like you're probably still going to buy some snacks. And if you buy a popcorn bucket at Disney World, a refillable collectible popcorn bucket, you're getting a good value because you can get discounted refills in your bucket. So it's still a really good one. It's just don't use your credit on it. Buy it outright and just know that that's one of the things you're buying. The popcorn buckets to any listeners that are not aware, people go nuts for you. Do you own popcorn buckets? I do. I have like five of the regular popcorn buckets, the ones that are like the $12, $13 ones that you can refill for so stinking cheap. Um, but we 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 have a figment popcorn bucket. We <laughs> we have multiple of these. I don't even know why I collect popcorn buckets. Like we don't use them. They're just sitting on the shelf collecting. How long have you wait in line for your figment popcorn bucket? Okay. So I have the best husband in the world who stood in line for us. Well, I took the kids. We wrote, we rode Soren. We did all of those things. He stood in line for three hours for our popcorn bucket. That is just insane to me, but I get it. People are in it. And yes, this year it's like actually the imagination building at Epcot. That's the popcorn bucket. It has like a little figment and I'm sure people are going to be waiting like crazy and Disney changes them out. For any smart moms travel agents listening today, our hidden Mickey is just going to be popcorn bucket. <laughs> <But> <laughs> For listeners, I want you to remember, don't use your snack credit on popcorn. Buy the bucket, enjoy the bucket. Think of it as a merchandise expense. You know, you're going to buy things, souvenirs. Think of it more like that and not food. And then you're kind of getting a discounted snack for your entire vacation because you can refill it for so cheap. I think what you were just saying about thinking about it as a merchandise is another great rule to think about when you're using the dining plan. If there's upgraded merchandise or like a bonus associated with your food that's typically not going to be covered with the dining plan. For instance, if you're buying a drink and they have the glowy ice cubes, you're going to get the drink included for your your alcoholic beverage, but you will not get the glowy ice cubes. You would have to pay for the up, upcharge because the dining package is not going to cover those merchandise type of things. I believe I told this story once before. We were having the best meal at Topolino's with my entire family. We could not wait to have this breakfast. And my niece and nephew got lemonades with those glowing ice cubes and Buzz Lightyear straws. And so of course my three kids wanted lemonades <laughs> with glowing ice cubes and Buzz Lightyear straws. And that's just not something I typically do, but of course I did it because we were with family and the cousins had it. Holy moly, that is quite an upcharge. <laughs> when that bill came, I was like, we'll never be doing that again, but it is fun. One time they loved it, whatever. I'll probably will do it again. But just keep in mind that those upgrades, sometimes it's either number one, it's not the best use of your credit or number two, it's not going to be included in your credit at all. So you're going to be paying on top of, of what the credit is covering. So probably not the best use. Quick service meals. Again, you're just going to kind of be looking at the value. But if you do that quick service plan, to me, it's just kind of you're, you're planning to sit down for less times than nights you're staying in most cases, right? Because you're not going to want four sit down meal credits if you're only going to sit down one time. There is an exception though. So I want to talk a little bit about the Disney dining plan and the way that one works. 
So with the Disney dining plan, you're still getting a snack credit to strategize the way we've just discussed, a quick service meal credit, but only one, whereas in the quick service plan, you get two and one table service credit. So again, those are going to be in credits allotted per night per person, ages three and up. And the value there is that you're planning on either sitting down to eat with your family at a table service meal pretty much every day, or you're going to be doing experiences that maybe you're not sitting down every day, but some of the sit down experiences at Disney World will cost you two credits. That's the signature dining experiences. We'll talk about what some of those are. You know, and in that case, for instance, I have a family that is so sweet that I booked that's heading to Disney World for their daughter's birthday. And they're only doing two nights. They're only doing two park days. It's a really quick trip. And they're hitting Magic Kingdom. And the one thing they really want to do, of course, for their little girl, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique in Cinderella's Royal Table. Well, they only have two nights, but it made a lot of sense for them to go ahead and add the dining plan on because Cinderella's Royal Table is two credits to sit down and eat. So by adding the dining plan, they're actually prepaying for that Royal Table meal and they will have a quick service meal for everybody in their party to either eat earlier in the day or for that second park day. So they're even prepaying for some more of their food and it just made sense all around. So what do you think about the value in the Disney dining plan versus the quick service and how you can use it? I love the way that you just laid that out. I think that that is a perfect scenario in that they have something they know they want to do. It's going to take two table service credits. But I think that the Disney dining plan is definitely not something for everyone. If your family is going to be willing to take a break or maybe take a rest day and do two table services in one day could be a really great use of that. If your family's willing to take that pause and sit down and have a great meal, that's a great use of the Disney dining plan. But if this is a we're run, 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 the quick service makes more sense. The Disney dining plan uh, which is the table service version, right? Has a lot of kind of nuances that you kind of want to keep in mind though, because you were laying out what how it's outlined, but there are some things you have to know. For instance, if you're going to breakfast, you're only getting your entree and a drink. You're not getting a dessert at breakfast with that table credit. And so keeping in mind that brunch, lunch, and dinner is going to be the best use of those table service credits. Also thinking through how buffets are going to play into that because the buffet is going to take the place of your entree and your dessert, right? So thinking through all of those strategic moves is going to be a big part of that. Yeah. And a lot of the character meals that people want to try are breakfast only. So just keeping that in mind, of course, there are some that are, are dinner only like uh, storybook dining. Let's just quickly talk about some of those restaurants that do require two credits because if these are on your must do list, and again, some of these are on that character meal ranking episode we did a few weeks back. So if you're not really sure which of those meals you want, make sure you listen to that so that you can really start to strategize in your mind what's going to make the most sense. But some that do require two credits, Akershus over at Epcot, but only for lunch and dinner requires two credits. Cinderella's Royal Table requires two credits. Storybook Dining at Artist Point, that's the Snow White meal over at Wilderness Lodge. Be Our Guest, I kind of think that one's surprising, although it is, you know, a really nice restaurant. Le Cellier over at Epcot in the France Pavilion. Hollywood Brown Derby in Hollywood Studios. Tiffin's at Animal Kingdom. Our favorite, Boathouse. Mm, that shocked me. Yeah, along with, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the one, Jaleo? Jaleo, I don't know. Haleo, Jaleo, it's over at Disney Springs along with Morimoto, mm-hmm. Paddlefish, Jico, the Cape Town Lounge, some some of these just finer dining, more expensive restaurants, the Flying Fish over at the Boardwalk, Topolino's Dinner, but not Breakfast, which is interesting because that breakfast is one of the most popular character meals on property and notably only one sit down credit, which is nice, along with the Hoopty Doo Review Toledo and the Yachtsman Steakhouse. So a lot of signature dining, a lot of things that are fancier or more expensive are going to require two credits. So if you know that any of those that I just mentioned are on your list, you need to account for that. I think that, and that felt like a lot, a lot of a list, but again, I would say that's less than 10% of Disney restaurants that you just listed. Far less, less than half. Right. Yeah. Probably like 5%. It's most restaurants are going to be covered in the table service. Yeah. It's, it's a great value. And, you know, depending on the length of your trip, 
even doing a two credit sit down meal could still really be the right choice for your family. There are also some notable restaurants that aren't covered. And if these are high priority on your list, like they are for others, keep that in mind as well. Space 220 at Epcot, really surprising, but it's it has a third party ownership to Disney. And so that's part of that. And then the California Grill, which a lot of people love to go to for those fireworks views and things, not included. So if those are on your list, again, you're wanting to strategize and make sure you know you're getting the best option in your package. I also want to mention fantastic dining packages, eat to the beat dining packages, things like that included. This is an upgrade from previous years because before you would have to pay an upcharge or use two credits. Basically, there's one restaurant at each of those places that is a two credit, right? If you want to do eat to the beat, I love getting eat to the beat and being able to get front and center to go watch those amazing um, performances in Epcot. Whatever festival you're at, you're at, there's going to be an eat to the beat type of dining package, right? Associated with the festival. And most of the restaurants that it does is only one credit and it's not an upcharge to have the dining package for the show anymore, except for like Le Cellier. If you do the steakhouse in Canada, it is still two two credits, but that's two credits no matter what, whether you're getting the show included or not. So even with that, it's not an upcharge. I love that they have changed this. Yeah, it, that was shocking to me. I can't begin to say how exciting I think it is because Fantasmic Dining Package is one of, I think it's almost a must do. I don't yeah. love sit down restaurants at Hollywood Studios. It should be well known by listeners of this show by now, but I do love Fantasmic and I do love Fantasmic from a good seat. So I would not do Hollywood Brown Derby. I probably wouldn't want to be using two credits, but I would do, you know, 50s Primetime Cafe. Or sci-fi. Yeah, have a great fun meal, a great seat for the show and have it in my dining plan. That to me is a good use of your time. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Basically, the things you need to remember when you're using this dining plan, hack that system, don't use things for a lesser value than Disney accounted for. If you have leftover credits, Use them. Do not leave Disney World with credits on your account. Go get prepackaged items from the confectionery at Magic Kingdom, bakery items, things you can take on the plane, nom nom cookies. What else would you get? Honestly, I think anything that you can do to get yourself to a snack place is a great place to go use that credits, right? Don't think about using your snacks at a restaurant. Think about using them at snack locations. You said the confectionery, that's a really great option. Using it towards one of the Dole Whip locations in Adventureland would be a really great option. They have a, what is the name of that Sunday? The I Lava You Float. Oh yeah. It's like $7.50 to buy. That would be a fantastic use of your credit. And then while you're walking out, out the gates of Magic Kingdom, stop at the confectionery and get some snacks to take with you on the plane. Just like you were saying, those are really, really really great options for using that. Or another idea, I know that Sean and I have done this multiple times. When we're using it, if we happen to have a leftover credit, gift that cre credit to somebody while they're checking out, just say, can I get that for you? I have extra credits and do that. Like pass the Disney like pixie dusting on to somebody who otherwise would be paying for that and just spreading that love. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we mentioned the cost of the quick service plan. I want to make sure listeners know the Disney dining plan that's going to include that sit down meal per day, per night of stay per person. Uh, that's going to be ninety four twenty eight per night for, per adult and twenty nine sixty nine per night per child ages three to nine. So again, you're just going to want to be totaling these up kind of examining which restaurants you're going to. And if you are confused, reach out to your smart mom's travel agent. A lot of us have planning guides on this, ways for you to strategize ahead of the trip and really decide what's what's going to be the best option. I had one other thought about ways to hack this system, which comes down to how can we make our money stretch further? If you are a family who is considering maybe that you want to test the waters of the Disney dining plan and not the quick service dining plan, most of the resorts are going to be giving you the quick service free with the promo that's running right now, right? But pretty much every year, I'm assuming it's going to come back every year at this point. Now that the dining plan is back, when that free dining is, is being offered, if you upgrade to a deluxe resort, it upgrades you to the full Disney dining plan. And sometimes that extra money that you're paying towards getting an upgraded experience in the resort is going to more than compensate for the additional dining upgrade that you're going to be getting. Yeah, basically... 
talk to your agent about these promos because yeah. not only can you be taking the value and running with it for your food, but you could also get an upgraded resort experience. And I just think this component is not only allowing you to strategize and budget better for your family and your experience, but it's also giving you wiggle room for play in a way that you wouldn't already otherwise have. And if I can prepay and not have to squint my eye <laughs> at, the, <laughs> at the bill in my inbox on, at the end of a wonderful vacation, then count me in. Also notable, remember your ID. If you're 21 and over and you're getting alcohol, you're going to be ID'd. My wife was not served. <laughs> and now that you have the dining plan, if you're doing that upgrade, you have to carry that with you. So keep that in mind. Make sure you have it. I feel like I have to mention that. That's That's so smart. Last other things that we're talking about ways to hack this system, right? Sharing meals, especially if you do quick service, sharing meals works out really, really well. There are several meals on Disney property that is more than enough for two people to share. And that can make help you stretch, right? You're essentially only getting two meal credits per day. But if you share a breakfast platter and then you share a lunch platter and then do uh, both of you are doing something for dinner, that can make your credits stretch further as well. Yeah, you can absolutely stretch these all the way across your vacation by sharing food and getting larger portions in your quick service, you know, just by looking through and seeing what that's going to be. Something else we haven't really talked about is how do you know what's included on the Disney dining plan? Is everything included? You tell me. Great question, right? <laughs> on the menus, there's going to be icons that dedicate things as marked as, yes, this is part of the Disney dining plan. And you'll see that when you get your introduction introduction information about your dining plan that will show you this represents a snack credit, this represents a quick service, etc. But in the app, there is really, really great notes, especially on the snacks that say things that qualify as snacks. And often you'll find things that will qualify as snacks that you wouldn't think would qualify as snacks. And here's what I really, really love about finding it in the app is... It says qualify for snack. And then typically the price is right there. And so that's helping you know, am I using a good credit on this? Like if it says $3.99 for three cuties and it says qualifies as a snack, we're not going to use our, our snack credits for that because that's just wasting your valuable snack credits. Yeah. Go find a better snack. Buy the cuties, but just buy them out of pocket and find a better snack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, one thing I think is really interesting to remember is that annual pass holders, DVC members, <laughs> and military families can all take advantage of the dining plan, either one. There are a lot of things that as a DVC owner, myself, an annual pass holder, yourself, Becky, that we can't take advantage of. You know, there are certain promos and things that we just can't, can't use because of our status in those ways. Disney dining plan is not one of those. We can use these and it's really, really awesome. So it's, it's touching a broader group of Disney travelers because so many, everybody can use the dining plan. That didn't used to be the case. You used to be excluded unless you had a room and ticket package. So I'm so glad they've added this. Yeah, it's perfect. And I, like I said, can't wait to use it myself. I love this conversation. I want, I encourage all listeners to add some form of a dining plan because I do think in the long run, you're going to save and have a better time. But I also encourage you to talk to your smart mom's agent about what fits into your plans the very best so that you can get the best value for what you're, what you're getting. I think that's it. You know, use your plan, hack your system, get your value and keep both eyes open when you look at your resort bill. <laughs> don't turn away with dread. Yeah. Once exactly. again, I want to remind all listeners, if you don't already have a smart mom's travel agent uh, that you are working with, check that link in your bio, hook up with somebody that you either have heard here on the podcast, one of the girls that are on this podcast, let us help you for free. Get this vacation underway, especially as we roll right on into 2024 and we're all planning our travels for the year. So we're excited to help. We're here and ready. I wanted to share a review from a Russell five who said these ladies know their stuff. This is the perfect to listen to on my drives to my kids events each evening as I dream of planning my next vacation. I love that. I love that we are getting you to and from all of those practices because Lord knows I am always driving my kids to and from practices and there's nothing I love to do more than dream about my next vacation when I'm stuck, not on my vacation at home. <laughs> yep. Disney blues is a real thing. Let us help you through that. I am joined now by another 
special guest here. We've been featuring other Smart Moms travel agents here on the show the last couple of weeks. And we are so excited as we head into this new year and continue on with episodes to be featuring more of our friends and, and travel agents. Today, I'm here with Anna Johnson, good friend of mine, amazing travel agent. Hi, Anna. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, hey, Allie. I'm super excited to be on here with you. As travel agents within this agency, we all really specialize in most of the same things, but some of us are just experts in other areas. And I want you to just tell listeners a little bit about yourself and a little bit more about what we're going to be talking about. Of course. Yeah. So I'm super excited to jump on the dining plan episode because one, I'm a lover of the dining plan. I started off originally as a Disney goer with a dining plan always in my pocket. But the biggest thing for my family to even be able to afford to do Disney multiple times was we are a military family and Disney takes incredible care of their military families. And so as a military family, I feel like my expertise comes in with not only knowing just the ins and outs of Disney in general, but being able to help my fellow military family members in learning the discounts that they can get the extras that are part of their trip that I can help make happen and just being able to help fellow military families and just serve them and then be able to have free services is just really incredible. Yeah. I'm so glad that you started by bringing up that you yourself are a military family. I want to talk a little bit more about the military offerings for Disney. So any of our listeners that are friends and family or connected in some way themselves to the military understand what a great opportunity Disney gives those service members. So we can book as travel agents, special military rates on rooms. And, and what do you think on average, do you know the percentage on average that a military family can, can save when staying on Disney property? So there is not like an official scale that Disney gives us, but I will say most of my families are saving between 15 to 30% off. Some of those bigger resorts, the deluxe club levels, things like that can even get up to 35% off. So in your value categories, you're going to save a little bit less just because it's already a cheaper resort. And then as you go up and price and in amenities, you do save more. So about 10 to 30% is the average. So higher overall price equals higher overall savings. And I really think, you know, you're going to be able to see deluxe resorts almost in that mid moderate price range. It's really attainable. Yeah. And military members tickets aren't tickets to Disney World are not something that we help with. Where, if you're a military family, what what is your best recommendation for tickets and, and getting into the parks as a military? So I would never tell my military families to buy regular price tickets because when they're able to buy them through maybe their military base, their local MWR or Shades of Green, which is a resort on Disney property that is owned by the DOD. So it sells military tickets there as well. When you go through those avenues, you save about 50% on average. So while it does take it out of our hands a little bit as travel agents, I'm happy to give that tool and information to my clients because it's a huge savings for military. And as I said, Disney takes care of them. What if you don't live near a local base and you're not going to Shades of Green? You can order them. You can have them sent to your house. That's correct. Absolutely. You can order through Shades of Green online and some bases even allow you to order over the phone. It just kind of depends um, where you are locally. But I'm a big advocate for Shades of Green because they do come activated. And there's a few different types of military tickets, but the military tickets that we really, really love are the ones from Shades of Green because they are activated, which means you don't have to go and confirm your ID with guest services. If they are not activated, you do have to confirm that you are a service member with guest services first. So ordering from Shades of Green is definitely going to be your best bet to get straight into the parks. That's such good information. And it's not unlimited tickets for an entire year. You have an annual allotment on tickets, but un- but what is the allotment on rooms? Yeah, absolutely. The tickets is six per military family. So if you have a husband and and a husband and a wife or spouses that have just one service member, you get six tickets. If you happen to have two service members in the family, you would get 12. But 
It is per service member only for the tickets. And then you are able to get three rooms sponsored with your military ID at Disney. I have actually never ran into the issue of if I come back later in the year, I am also able to get the rooms. But per stay, you're only allowed to have three. You can sponsor up to three rooms. I'm so glad you just said that. I was actually working with a military family this week. And when I was on the phone helping them with their reservation, the cast member said unlimited for the year on rooms. Yeah, they could go, you know, another time of year. But it's just that per se, you have to be mindful of um, yes. three rooms per se, but unlimited times per year. So I thought yeah, that was absolutely. Really, really awesome. Yeah. So one thing that we mentioned earlier on the show is that the dining plan now as it's being presented this year is something that annual pass holders DVC members and military members can take advantage of. And that wasn't always the case with Disney for all three of those pillars. Tell us how it's possible for military families. So when you book your room under the military rate, that's what it's just going to be. It's going to be a room because you're going to get your tickets elsewhere so that you can have that huge discount. When you book your room, you have two options of bookings. And some people don't know about this. So you have the option of a room only booking or what's known as a basic package with Disney. Room only is just that. It is only your room and only that. It's still going to be the same percentage off, but you will pay a deposit that is your one night stay plus taxes and fees. So then if we go over to the basic package side, the basic package is going to be only a $200 deposit. And then along with that, you do get magical extras such as the uh, putt-putt golf, your luggage tags, things like that. And then the basic package also gives you the ability to add the dining plan into your package. So you don't have to jump through hoops and loops to try and get the dining plan. As long as you have that basic package, you're able to add on those extras. And the dining plan is definitely one you want to add. Price wise, everything's going to look the same either way you do this. But just knowing that there is a way for military families to save to really be taken care of, as you have said many times by Disney and also take that added value of the dining plan and add it to their stay. So we're super excited. I'm so excited to see not only the dining plan coming back, but it being able to be used by so many different people. I mean, everybody can use the dining plan. Absolutely. It's so amazing. It's so worth it. And it is just such a convenience. It does save you money. And it personally for me will always be a must. Well, thank you so much. That was so helpful. And I hope that any military families listening will reach out to their Smart Moms travel agent. I'm going to let you plug a couple of your socials so that people can reach you directly if they would like. But before we do any of that, we're going to do a dining plan edition of the Lightning Lane. So I'm going to ask you some quick questions. You give me some quick answers. Are you ready? Awesome. Yep. I'm ready to go. Okay. What is your favorite sit down meal at Animal Kingdom? Um, Tusker House. Oh, I love Tusker House. Breakfast is my favorite. <laughs> love it. It's so fun and it's unique. I love it. It's a must. Yeah. Favorite snack at Hollywood Studios? Oh, um, I'm just not a big snacker at Hollywood Studios. I would just say like a Joffrey's coffee. I love coffee all day long. Give me a good iced coffee. <laughs> okay, fine. What's your favorite sit down meal at Hollywood Studios? Mama Melrose. Favorite uh, quick service meal at Magic Kingdom? Ooh, Pecos Bills. Favorite snack pavilion at a festival at Epcot? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I am going to say Rose. And I don't know if that is a snack, but. We're going to take it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Favorite sit down meal at Epcot. Mm. Beer garden. We have different answers for every one of these. Do we really? (laughs) Yeah. That would like so not be my pick, but people love it. Yeah. I really love it. I like to try unique flavors when I'm at Disney world. There's so many options and I just want to try the unique things that I'm not going to get at home. Yeah. That's a good point. What about your favorite character meal? Um, I think it's going to always be Topolino's, which I I feel like is everybody's, but I just love the vibes there. The food's really good. But then to go out on the terrace after you eat and like, just get the views is top notch for me. Yeah. I love it too. Okay. Last one. Favorite uh, table service at Magic Kingdom. Mm, Be our guest probably because of the vibes too. I am a big Belle fan. And so Belle is like there. Belle's not even there. I know she's not, she's not, he said she's not even there. (laughs) She's not there, but I love, again, it's like, I'm such a four, an Enneagram four, and it's all about the feels and the vibes for me. And so it's, it's, it's all there. I'd be our guest. Okay. I lied. One more. What's your favorite resort dining? Ohana. Hands down. 10 times over. Love Ohana. Breakfast or dinner? Both. I could eat both for every meal for the rest of my life. 
I really love breakfast at Ohana. Don't dinner was just okay for me. I just love the noodles at dinner, which very sad. I actually am not supposed to eat gluten anymore. And my doctor told me it'd be good for me to stop. And and I don't think I can have the noodles anymore. So I'll just smell them. <laughs> well, before we go, thank you so much. This is great. And I hope listeners learned a little bit about military offerings and what you can do. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media. We'll make sure we link all of your information in today's show notes. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at take me to the castles with an S on Instagram. And you can join if you're a fellow military family, you can join my Facebook group, Smart Moms Plan Disney for Military Families on Facebook. And I'm happy to chat with any of you guys if you ever have military questions at all. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Allie. (laughs) We appreciate all of our listeners. We look forward to a lot more fun that we're going to have together this year. And until next time, we'll see you real soon. 